Chapter 3. Boston. Seven years ago. Dan, my older brother, led me down a cobblestone alley with red brick walls. You ready to experience the best breakfast joint in the whole city? He asked. It wasn't exactly time for breakfast. In fact, it was the middle of the day. But we'd spent the whole morning building forts and waging war against one another in his apartment. Dan was a history major and knew just about every Civil War fact in existence. He had piles of Civil War stuff lying around and even had a real artilleryman's sword. It was shorter than a typical sword, but Dan thought it fit my 11-year-old size perfectly. He strapped it to my waist with a belt and told me to use it to guard my fort against the incoming armies of Robert E. Lee, who ended up being Dan wearing a blazer over his pajamas. Do they have bacon? I asked. He gave me a flat look. I already said that it was the best breakfast joint in the whole city. Of course they have bacon. We ended up at an old door with the words, everything nice engraved in its wood. It had taken three side streets to get there, but when we finally did, the empty alley made the whole thing feel like some special secret that only Dan knew. He pushed open the door. The rush of smells that wafted over me were magical. Frosting and sugar and freshly baked waffles. Come on, he said, beckoning me inside. A waitress with a blue dress and a name tag that read Doreen sat us at one of the half dozen tables crammed inside the modest dining room. Dan ordered coffee. It smelled nutty and sweet. We shared a meal from the menu called The Heap. It was a stack of sugar-glazed waffles and two plates of bacon and eggs. Cubes of soft butter melted through the squares of the waffles, forming little rivers that pooled on a plate dusted in powdered sugar and cinnamon. Before I could make a move, Dan reached across the restaurant table and snatched a piece of bacon right off my plate. Hey, I said, but it was too late. He grinned at me. Sorry, Jax, older brother's entitlement. The oldest brother at the table always gets the soggiest piece of bacon. It's pretty much the law. He picked up an extra crispy piece from his own plate and handed it to me. You can have this one instead. I smiled. Dan knew how much I loved crispy bacon. But the truth was, he loved it too. When we were younger, we'd always fight over the crispiest pieces. Apparently not anymore. Some of my friends at home had siblings leave for college, and once they were gone, it was like they forgot everything and everyone they'd left behind. Not Dan. Ever since he left home, he had found little ways to let me know he remembered me, which was why I was sitting across the table from him in the first place. This was Dan's spring break, and instead of filling it with parties and road trips, he convinced mom and dad to fly me, his dorky 11-year-old brother, all the way from Houston so I could stay with him for the week, build forts, reenact Civil War battles, and eat breakfast together. He was my best friend, my hero. You have powdered sugar on your lips, I said with a smirk. It's not powdered sugar, he said. It's ground up bone dust from children who crossed my bridge without permission. He crossed his eyes, twisted his lips, and stuck out his tongue in his classic bridge troll face. I laughed, sucking in air and coughing on a bit of inhaled powdered sugar. A dull chatter and hurried footsteps sounded right outside. Someone shouted. I looked up from my waffles and through the window opposite the alley. A woman, hovering in the sky. She levitated right above the heads of the crowd. A small blue cape fell from her shoulders to the middle of her back. She wore a short pink skirt that barely covered anything, and her tight white t-shirt scooped so low down her chest that my 11-year-old self couldn't help but blush. It's one of them, I said, my eyes wide with excitement. One of the epics. I'd heard of her before. Love struck. I stood up from my chair and bolted toward the door, ignoring Dan's shouted, don't. He tried to grab for me, but I was already gone. He fought his way through the crowd to reach me as I slipped through, going the wrong direction in a group of people who sensed more danger than I did. Lovestruck gave the crowd a sultry look, scanning them one by one. Finally, she settled on me. She blew a kiss in my direction. 
my heart jittered. But there were two things I didn't understand in that moment. First, love struck's blown kisses reversed the blood flow of those she targeted. Second, she wasn't blowing a kiss at me. She was blowing one to my brother standing behind me. The next time Dan's heart beat, the blood in his veins rushed back toward his heart, causing valves to swell and arteries to rupture. I heard a soft snick, like an underfilled water balloon being squeezed until it popped. Dan gripped my shoulder. I spun around. His eyes were wide, panicked. He clutched his chest. And then he fell forward into the street. I dropped to my knees next to him. Dan's eyes didn't move, and his skin was pale. The blood drained from his extremities. Powdered sugar still dusted his lifeless lips. I pushed my hands down on his chest again and again. I had seen people do CPR in movies a million times and I tried my best. But you can't restart a heart that can no longer beat. I looked up at love struck. She was almost giddy at what she'd done. Then she bit her bottom lip as if eager to try again. New epics, first exploring their powers, often went on killing rampages simply to see what they could do. Even good people quickly turned into bloodthirsty murderers when they gained powers. My 11-year-old wide-eyed adulation for superheroes hadn't yet adjusted to reality. Dan's death fixed that. Love struck fluttered her fingers at me in a flirty, teasing wave. And then she flew in circles, eyes scanning the crowd for another victim. Everyone around me scattered in panic, screams blended with the hysterical slap of footsteps. Store owners barred their doors and yanked down metal window coverings to prevent the frenzied public from entering. Epic murders had a way of injecting more and more selfishness into the world. What else could people do but take care of themselves? More bodies crumpled. Part of me wanted Lovestruck to take me too, so the noise and cries would end, and I could fall beside Dan in quiet stillness. Eventually, sirens shrieked over the pandemonium. Police officers shouted and formed up in little squads. Gunshots cracked through the air. I hovered over Dan, shielding his body from the chaos. Lovestruck soared down the street with the police in pursuit. As the streets quieted, a team of paramedics poured in, moving from victim to victim. One of the paramedics, a man wearing a white long-sleeved shirt with a blue patch on his shoulder, scrambled to Dan's side. The man had the bluest eyes I'd ever seen, like gemstones. They glistened in the sunlight, bright with eager hope and determination. And for a moment, those blue eyes made me think that Dan wasn't gone after all. He checked Dan's pulse and his breathing, his laminate name badge bouncing against his chest. Atlas Butler. In school, I'd learned about a mythical man named Atlas who held up the world. As I watched the paramedic work, it was as if he were holding my entire world in his hands. A prickling buzz of hope stirred through me, just in time for Atlas to sigh and ever so slightly shake his head. I'm sorry, was all he said as his blue eyes met mine. They weren't as bright now. He stood, touching my shoulder as he walked away. One by one, the paramedics left. Many of the bodies were taken, but there wasn't room in the ambulances for Dan. They assured me that they'd return for us, but as I waited, they never came. I stayed in the streets at my brother's side until we were alone. I wanted to cry. I wanted to scream and wail and sob into Dan's shoulder. But something heavy inside my chest kept me still, waiting silently clutching his cold, bloodless hand. 
The world somehow felt both bigger and smaller at the same time. Part of me wanted to hide in a bathtub and never come out, and part of me wanted to run as fast as I could through the open streets, screaming and yelling every word I'd been taught never to say. But a third part, the part that felt like wet snow, told me not to leave my brother's side. That if I held his hand long enough, it would feel warm once again. But it never happened. I don't know how long it was before I noticed the man watching me from across the way. He stood beside an iron bench. Eventually, he stepped forward. My muscles tensed, and I clutched my brother's lifeless hand tighter. It's okay, son, the man said, holding up his hands placatingly. I'm not going to hurt you. He looked around at the empty streets. Where are your parents? My throat felt dry and stiff, and the words were slow to come. I'm visiting my brother, I said, squeezing Dan's hand. He nodded. Let's get you home then, he said. Where do you live? Houston. The man's face wilted like a scoop of ice cream in the sun. Houston. I nodded. I see. The look in his eyes told me that something was wrong with Houston. I, he sighed and started again. I don't really know how to tell you this, but Houston, it's, it's what? I asked. Obliteration, he said. He'd been saving up energy for weeks. Uh, waiting. He shook his head, coming back to the moment. Do you have anywhere else to go? I shook my head. All my family is in Houston. No grandparents or aunts or uncles or anyone elsewhere? I shook my head again. How old are you? Eleven. A sad smile turned up the right side of his mouth. That puts you in the fifth grade, yes? I nodded. I used to teach fifth grade. What's your name, son? Jax. He extended a hand to me. It's nice to meet you, Jax. I'm John, but some people call me Prof. Prof let me stay by my brother's body until someone finally came to take him away. Epic-caused deaths were becoming enough of a norm that the city had been forced to turn part of the Boston Common into a potter's field. That's where they would take Dan, Prof guessed, along with anyone else killed by Lovestruck that day. Nobody ever contacted me to verify Dan's identity or tell me where they had put him. I never heard anything about him ever again. Prof took me to an apartment a few miles away. I'd taken the silver class ring from my brother's finger and put it on my own, but it was too big even for my thumb. Prof made me dinner, carrot sticks and microwaved hot dogs. I uh, don't really have any hot dog buns or ketchup or, well, uh, anything else that goes on hot dogs. I took a bite, though I wasn't hungry. The food tasted empty and gray inside my mouth. I probably could have been eating anything in that moment, and it all would have tasted the same. I forced myself to chew after forgetting several times that I still had food in my mouth. I'd uh, offer you dessert, but uh, I don't really have anything like that. I stared at the three carrot sticks and the plain hot dog. The tears still wouldn't come. All I wanted was to feel them run down my face. Why couldn't I cry? What was wrong with me? Dan would have cried for me. Prof didn't say much the rest of that night. He set up a spot on the couch for me to sleep and gave me a few blankets. I didn't use them, though. If Dan was going to freeze outside in the ground, I could at least go a night without blankets. The next morning, Prof heated up some canned ham and put it on a plate with more carrot sticks for breakfast. He seemed embarrassed as he handed me the food. I'm 
not much of a cook, he said. But I found these. He showed me a package of ice cream bars. I joined him at the table and we ate. After a long silence, he spoke again. There's some friends of mine, not too far from here, that might be able to take care of you for a while. Where do they live? I asked. New York. It's only a few hours drive from here, and it's safe. Safer than most places, at least. What about Dan? I said, still thinking about his cold body lying in the ground somewhere. I'm sorry, Prof said. It's okay, I said, though nothing felt okay. Are we leaving today? Prof nodded. A similar silence was all I offered Prof the day after Dan's death. He and I packed up and left before noon. The last thing he grabbed after hesitating over a pile of old books and pictures was a lab coat. He swung it on and shrugged when he saw me looking. Reminders of our old lives, like your brother's ring, he explained. We can't go back to those, but we can build new ones. He took me to Dan's apartment before we left Boston for good, said I should say goodbye once more. Everything was as we'd left it. The whole kitchen table was covered in parts from old Civil War muskets that we'd been trying to put back together. I liked tinkering with Dan. Combining bits together and building something great out of seemingly nothing. The parts were in neat little piles. Piles of different sized triggers, locks, muzzles, and breeches. There were half a dozen different barrels all lined up beside one another, and even a couple of bayonets and ramrods. It was a puzzle of sorts, finding the right pieces to build a complete picture. Anything you want to take with you? Prof said, turning one of the musket stocks over in his hand. This. I said, picking up the model 1832 foot artillery sword. A sword? I nodded. Prof shrugged. All right. I kept the sword with me in the front seat as we drove. It made me feel safe. Prof talked to fill the silence, and I listened without reacting. He told me about a group called the Reckoners, about who they were and what they did. He talked about vengeance and making things right again. Of killing epics like Love Struck and stopping them from being able to hurt anyone else ever again. Are you a Reckoner? I asked him. He was silent in turn. The Reckoners are going to do everything they can to stop the epics from hurting people the way they hurt you and your brother, he said at last. It wasn't an answer, but I perked up at his last words. There was something right about them, something meaningful. Like heroes, I said. He looked at me, pulling his eyes away from the road. Something like that. I met his eyes and spoke with as much earnestness as I could muster. I want to be a hero too, I said, feeling my fingers curl around the brass hilt of the small sword. Probably every kid my age had said those words at some point or another, but I felt them, really felt them. I needed to rescue some other 11-year-old boy from having to watch the life drain from his brother's eyes, from losing everything and everyone who meant something to him. I thought of Atlas, the paramedic who'd tried to help but couldn't. I could still picture the hope in his eyes as he worked, the effort, the determination. That was who I wanted to be like. And even though Atlas hadn't managed to save Dan, he was trying to be a hero trying to hold the world up. But he needed help, and I would be that help. I don't want them to take away anyone else from anyone, the way they took Dan away from me, I continued. My voice felt sticky and dry at the same time. A hollowness warbled through it that felt strangely distant. I knew the words were mine, but they sounded odd. I want to keep people safe, like you and Atlas. You saved me, and I want to save people too. It was a long moment before his eyes watched the road again. He was quiet, and I could see in the scrunch of his brow that his mind was chewing through things he wasn't saying. 
I slumped back against the seat and stared out the window. I wanted to save people. Protect them. I wanted to be a hero. I needed to be a hero.